be our discussion, and I guess we'll all find out. <laughs> yeah, I've tried to make connections to the morning talks and to the others that were on the program. I don't think I can manage the Mars mission at this stage, sorry. But I'll, I'll time an hour, and I've got 25 slides. Uh, I, I'm not sure we'll get through them. I don't need to. So let's just have discussions as they come up, and we'll try and deal with any questions that have real answers straight away. Some of these questions could be very open-ended, and we should have discussions that continue over lunch and dinner and hiking and so on. Um, so I brought basically an overview talk and tried to add a couple of slides to make more contacts with this morning's talks. Um, and I'm going to talk about energy landscapes, and particularly the kinetic transition network aspect. Uh, our objective, my objective, is always to use stationary points, minimum transition states, of this potential energy surface as both a conceptual and a computational tool. So Dagash just explained uh, minimum transition states in the context of the Thompson problem. Um, this provides us with a coarse graining straight off the bat uh, and a conceptual way to think about problems, uh, but also to develop novel algorithms for solving them numerically. And the three main strands are structure prediction, which which we're using basin hopping for global optimization. So we'll show you an example of that. Basin sampling for global thermodynamics, I've cut all that, I'm not going to do it, because this net, uh, meeting is supposed to be about transition networks, so we need discrete path sampling to describe global kinetics. And this means the construction of minimum transition state, minimum triples that are all connected together to try and converge the property of interest, which is usually a rate constant in this case. And at this point, I normally try to contrast what we can do for small molecules like this water trimer on the left, where you can easily find all the stationary points and pathways at a very high level of electronic structure theory, with large systems on the right. Um, I'll describe this one first. So this is the water trimer, and we were inspired by talks by Richard Sakely in 1993, where he came uh, and described his cavity ring down experiments in Berkeley. And he maps out tunneling splittings of this system, each water molecule is of hydrogen bond, single donor and acceptor, and this, there's a, uh, a mechanism where this proton flips up and down, and it, because it's a light particle and it's not going very far, you get very large tunneling splittings from that, and if you do six of them in a row, follow that blue one down, then up, then down, then up, do it six times, you get back to where you started from, each one of these Local minima is a permutation inversion isomer supporting an identical stack of rho vibronic wave functions. If those wave functions can leak sufficiently through the barriers that separate them, then you get tunneling splittings. And you could put a matrix element on the edge of each uh, of these arrows, call it beta. Uh, that's our tunneling matrix element called the self-energy alpha. And then uh, any undergraduate chemist should be able to tell you the splitting pattern because this is isomorphic to the pi system of benzene molecule, and you get A, E, E, A. And indeed, that is the way it works out experimentally. Uh, we're using the same tools of geometry optimization to find these pathways and stationary points uh, for a small system as we do for a large system. This is a Voronoi representation of 600 colloidal particles confined to a liquid, liquid capillary bridge, and so we've got a repulsive type potential in here. It's a more general Thompson problem, if you like. This was done by Helen Kasumatmaja, who's now at Durham. Uh, so the uh, hexagons are in green. These are particles with six neighbors. You can see pentagons. You can see hex hectagons. And let's see a movie. So what do the rearrangements look like? This is a movie of the steepest descent pathways that connect uh, two very different defect type structures, and I've switched back to a particle representation. Uh, and if you look at it, you can find very localized things happening, but very delocalized ones as well. So there's no reaction coordinate. You couldn't possibly have guessed anything like that, and you don't need to. Uh, there are five or six transition states on this uh, composite pathway that links two topologically different um, minima. So we have similar things for the Thompson problem, but I think this one is the prettiest movie that I've got at the moment. So that, that's 
all predicated on having efficient geometry optimization, basically. We're converting our problem into finding those pathways and then using statistical mechanics and unimolecular rate theory to uh, put back in the statistical weightings appropriately for all the thermodynamics and kinetics. So before I forget, this could be my most important message that self-organization is somehow encoded in funneled landscapes. And the representation I'm using here is a disconnectivity graph, where energy increases on the vertical axis. The bottom of every line is the energy of a local minimum. The horizontal axis is arbitrary, so you can move these lines around uh, so that they don't cross to give a nice representation. We're not calculating anything from these uh, graphs. We're just visualizing the landscape from them. You join up the minima at the lowest energy where they can interconvert. And you know that because you've calculated the transition states. And you do it at a discrete set of energies, which you can choose. And you choose it to give the nicest representation so that you can uh, visualize what the landscape looks like. And in each of these four cases, an atomic cluster, uh, a, a shell of particles, these both have icosahedral point group symmetry. This is a segment of an infinitely repeated silicon lattice using an empirical potential. And this is the GB1 peptide. In each case, we've got one well-defined global minimum. We have no competitive structures uh, separated by high barriers. So these landscapes I would call unfrustrated. Uh, and they probably all have the small world properties for exactly that reason. On the other hand, somebody normally now asks me what a glassy landscape looks like. So here's one ca uh, calculated by Vanessa de Souza for um, a 60 particle uh, glass former with periodic boundary conditions. And here there's a really an exponentially large number of similar amorphous minima, similar energies, but with high barriers between them. So as you lower the temperature, uh, on some time scale, you'll end up being trapped in different subregions. But because they're all rather similar, uh, it's a rather interesting sort of phase transition, which we could talk about for a long time, but I wasn't going to. Go on. So this tree-like structure, we should take from this that the landscape has an ultrametric structure with basins and sub-basins. Yes, this one has some sort of fractal property, I would guess, maybe multifractal. Uh, this, these are much simpler, and finding a way to quantify that isn't, isn't so easy, though we've, we've, we're about to publish a paper with five or six different metrics of how frustrated the landscape is, uh, ranging from good structure seekers to glassy landscapes and jammed systems. And, and it, uh, we do have a measure, uh, which is a single number, that reflects that complexity, uh, which might be useful. I prefer just looking at the graphs, though. So I'm going to use these in the talk. Are there any questions about them? The energy increases up the page, and the horizontal axis can be an order parameter, but at the moment it's pretty arbitrary. Is that all right? Good. OK. And it, wave at me if I can't see anybody, please, because if there are questions, I might not notice. Thanks. Uh, right. The first thing I'd like to know is what's at the bottom of my landscape. If I don't know that, I don't know very much. So I'd better do some global optimization. This is not going to be deterministic. It's going to be stochastic. Uh, so you run it from different starting points. And if 10 of them give you the same answer, you may well conclude that that's a likely global minimum. And I'm going to call that a putative global minimum. And we've done lots of different things, ranging from atomic clusters uh, binary Leonard Jones glasses. This is the system for that glassy landscape I just showed you. You'll find papers where people say it doesn't have a crystal, but it does. Uh, you can find it with basin hopping. Uh, in basin hopping, you basically have a structure, a configuration, you minimize it, you propose a move which can be a uh, perturbation of Cartesian coordinates, you minimize again, and you accept or reject a step to the new minimum. That's, in a nutshell, what basin hopping does. And then you refine it for 10 or 20 years <laughs> and make it more efficient with s smart moves. Uh, there are all sorts of fascinating results like knotted global minimum, minima predicted for the Stockmere potential, which is dipolar. Uh, you can do molecular clusters. You can do the Thompson problem. You can do uh, structure prediction for proteins, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, pretty much anything that has a potential energy function. So here's one of the pretty ones. Mm -hmm. This actually has point group I, not IH. It has 12 of these rosette motifs. 
and this satisfies the Euler condition for um, a defect number of 12 because if you count the number of pentagons and hexagons, this is topologically equivalent to just one pentagon, so you've got 12 of them. It's a Voronoi representation of the global minimum for the Thompson problem with 1,902 particles. Putative global minimum, excuse me. But it's very pretty. And the, uh, we put these animated GIFs on the website, and then I discovered somebody had concatenated all of them, stuck them on YouTube. So my street cred went up with the children that day. <laughs> so that has a bit of chirality, that's why it doesn't have the full... That's right, it's I, not IH. Yeah, it's Carol. Good, okay, so I'll, I'm going to attempt a demo as well. So I'm going to run not a movie, but a demonstration on one core of this laptop. And uh, I'm going to do 150 Leonard Jones particles seeded with today's date, and it doesn't matter whether it's the UK or US version because I add them together. Uh, we're going to use the GMIN program, more of which later, and these are snapshots. So these are some of the minima we're moving through. This is the lowest one so far, and the colours are meaningful. Oh, okay, that's the global minimum. That was fast. Um, today is a good day to look for global minima. Uh, the blue ones have the lowest pair energy, the most tightly bound particles, the red ones are the we most weakly bound and the green ones are in between. And I've put three particles on the surface here to make it harder so that I would have more time to explain it. <laughs> but it didn't work. Okay, so I'll, I'll do something that might take a little bit longer, but probably not, hopefully not too much longer. Because I know. Let's see it with the data again. This is going to be 15 uh, water molecules using a rigid body representation, random starting point today's date, and it's the same deal, snapshots on the left, lowest on the right, uh, and these are the current energies, and here the colours again mean something in terms of the number of hydrogen bonds accepted and donated, and this is not quite the global minimum yet, that's fairly close, but water, that's the right oxygen arrangement, now that's the right hydrogen arrangement, so that's the global minimum, and for that Leonard Jones cluster, I should say they're probably something like 10 to the power 150 minima times 150 factorial. So the fact that it works in about 10 seconds tells you something about the landscape, I think. It's a funnel. It's been guided down to a well-defined global minimum. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Okay, what next? Uh, yeah, pretty pictures of the Thompson problem. We could talk more about that in terms of the defects that emerge. Uh, but I think I'd rather press on and get to some kinetic transition networks, if that's all right. Are there, are there any questions about the Thompson problem? So what's the little stringy thing in the A plus 435? That one. That is a grain boundary growing, I think. That's how other people have described it before. And in this regime, it's the David Nelson type regime with uh, a continuum elastic theory applying better. Uh, and a continuum elastic theory works quite well for some of these sizes as well, but it doesn't give the details of the defects. So there are quite a few interesting motifs that arise for all these different sizes. But this is a, an example of where things can change dramatically with size. So this 1632 is a magic number where you can have an icosahedral global minimum. 1633 doesn't have that, and the landscape is probably completely different. So the small world properties are not necessarily properties of a potential. They're more likely properties of a specific system and size. So I'll press on, okay, discrete path sampling. This is how I'm going to make my kinetic transition networks. And uh, these cartoons show um, products and reactants, capital A and capital B, which are sets of local minima, little a and little b. And in the simplest case, the rate of interconversion from products to reactants is given by properties of this boundary. The uh, conditional probability of being in a minimum little b, given that you're in region big B, uh, times the transition rate, a waiting time. Uh, and in more generally, you don't want everything to be product and reactant, you want something in between, I for in between or intervening, and you're only going to get single exponential kinetics in this case if you can put these guys in steady state, which means that uh, P dot, the probability of, of occupation uh, as a uh, derivative of time is zero, and you need local equilibria in the two endpoints 
to get a single exponential decay and a well-defined phenomenological rate constant. And you can uh, do a bit of maths and work out that this overall rate constant, B to A, SS stands for steady state, can be written as a sum, an infinite sum of all the possible pathways between B and A. The conditional probability is P little b divided by P big B, and these capital P's are branching probabilities. So given that I'm in I2, what's the probability that I go to I1? Uh, and after scratching your head for a few years, you realize that actually this can be written in terms of a committer probability, uh, and this is Onsager's uh, committer probability that he thought about for dissociation of sodium chloride in water originally. And it's a nice, neat, compact formula. This is the probability that uh, the system will visit an A, a product, before it returns to reactant. So just a few more words. Um, discrete path sampling is basically growing a database using geometry optimization from minima and transition states. Uh, and we can pick out the pathways that make the largest contributions to the steady state rate constant. There are all sorts of tricks you can now use from graph theory or nice uh, algorithms that work here. You need appropriate edge weights for your graph, which become minus log of the branching probability, uh, because that will then reconstruct that product in the sum for you. And you can make hierarchies of expressions uh, depending upon how accurately you would like these things and which approximations you want to put in. And I should say that uh, I've assumed a Markov assumption here for all the transitions. We can regroup the database uh, using free energy thresholds, if you tell me a temperature, and I can work out some approximate densities of states. Um, of course, there are other approximations systematically, like incomplete sampling. I'd, you never know. You, how can you know what you haven't found? <laughs> you can't. You can just run it for twice as long and see if it changes. Um, I'm using generally harmonic densities of states because it's quick and convenient and at low temperature accurate. Uh, but you don't have to. They could be quantum, they could be anharmonic. And I'm using unimolecular rate theory, uh, uh, usually transition state theory, for each of the local minimum to minimum rate constants. Okay, lots of examples by now. Uh, these are clusters and condensed matter. And this is an old two-dimensional Leonard Jones problem for migration of an atom t from the inside to the outside. Um, my, uh, 20 minutes, I probably have time to show you that actually. And I was definitely going to do the 38 problem, which is my favorite at the moment. Uh, but uh, we've done molecular things. I showed you global optimization. You can do bulk and you can do biomolecules. And uh, we've got all sorts of things, amyloid formers associated with disease, um, conformational changes associated with function in proteins. Uh, and I'll show you this one with a trefoil knot in. I think I will do this. I think I've got time. Uh, any questions so far? I think this is a nice pedagogical example um, because we discussed permutation inversion isomerization earlier. So here's a really simple system. It's two dimensions. Do you know what the Leonard Jones potential is? Everybody know, happy with that? Something with a well. Okay. So John Leonard Jones. Um, there are only four minima. Here they are. And I've lumped together all the permutation inversion isomers. Uh, you don't get inversion, actually, for two dimensions. So these are all the permutational isomers of each one. And then if you distinguish one atom in red, you're going to split this graph according to how many symmetry distinct sites there are. So here there are two. So the global minimum splits into two. Um, but if we take this one, there are one, two, three, four different sites. One, uh, two, three, four. There they are. So they're all there. That's what happens when you distinguish one atom. And we'd like to know how quickly you can exchange that with the outside. This was a nice uh, benchmark system that uh, David Chandler proposed with some co-workers quite a while back now uh, for their dynamical transition path sampling. Uh, and they got rates for individual parts of it, but not the overall one. I'm going to try and do a demo for this, I think. Let's see if it's a good day to do demos. So, can you give me an integer between 1 and 1,000? 512. 512. That's not what we agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Well, you know the British love a heroic failure. Um, <clears throat> let's see if you manage to break it. 512. Okay. So I'm going to run this on, I think, just one core of this laptop, actually. 
and we're going to start from a pathway with uh, four steps. The blue ones, I'm recalculating all these things. Oh, it's finished, okay. Uh, thank you, that was a good number. So this is an Arrhenius plot, log of the rate constant against one over the temperature. It's a nice straight line. Uh, blue and red. Uh, blue is what we've just calculated, and red is what I'd get if I ran it for half an hour. So on a log scale, I don't really care. I don't want to run it for half an hour. Um, And here's the mechanism. I'll just stop it. So there were four three-step pathways in blue, and they contribute 74% of the rate constant. And I've illustrated all four of them on the same slide. So just look at one of these. Uh, in each case, you're going to see three diamond square diamond rearrangements. So can you see why they're called diamond square diamond? Because we make an edge and we break it perpendicular. And basically, the order of events is different for these four pathways. You have to count them and sum them appropriately to get an overall rate constant. If I stop that one there, you can see there's a nice square. And Bill Lipscomb proposed a diamond square diamond mechanism for uh, uh, clusters, borohydrate clusters, back in the 80s. He's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he died last year, actually. Or was it earlier this year? Uh, I was astounded when I visited Harvard in 1998 to have an office next door to him. And he was, still, he was um, over 80 then, I think. Okay, so that's uh, an example that now runs rather quickly. Uh, here's one that is going to be more complicated. So this is a 38 particle cluster, <clears throat> and it's one of my favorite examples. It started out as an example of broken ergodicity um, and sampling and global optimization. It's now too easy as a global optimization problem. But until 1995, this incomplete icosahedron was believed to be the lowest minimum. It isn't, it's this one, at least it's the lowest we know of, and I bet my house it is the lowest one. Uh, you see there's a big energy gap here actually. It's a fragment of FCC lattice, and all these red lines have the same FCC type motif, but they're slightly de defective. So this is a double funnel, and it's a very, uh, very interesting double funnel. We have low potential energy, high entropy. So it exhibits a phase transition as you raise the temperature. Uh, and here's the heat capacity, and here is a solid-solid transition peak, uh, where the temperature uh, means that these guys are in equilibrium, uh, roughly. And it's at, at this temperature, the barrier is about 30 kT. So it becomes a difficult problem to sample. It suffers from broken ergodicity, and conventional sampling algorithms really struggle to actually do this properly. Um, you can also look at the kinetics, and here I've got the occupation probabilities of minima in this icosahedral funnel and the FCC one. And you can see there's a plateau at around 10 to the 9 in reduced Leonard Jones time units, where you might think you'd reached equilibrium. You've reached a local equilibrium. This double funnel landscape exhibits a separation of time scales because some of the, most of the probability ends up down here to begin with, and then it has to climb out all the way up here and go back down to reach the true global minimum. So you have to wait to about 10 to the 13 time steps for true equilibrium to be achieved. So the take home message is double funnel landscape. This is going to be interesting. It's go it may exhibit a heat capacity feature, and it's going to have a separation of time scales for different relaxation processes. And I was very excited by this Sorry, paper. Sorry, that's for you. So the second peak is then delocalization with the entire. The second peak was melting. Melting. Yeah. I was excited by this paper from uh, Taya Kirchen, Athen, and Pisciani. Uh, because they looked at LJ38, we, we calculated the rates in 1998. And we've been waiting since then for somebody else to do it, to see uh, if we got it right. And they actually haven't got rates in this paper, but they do have rates, and they do agree with ours. We just haven't published them yet. They point out that somebody else who best remained nameless burnt 10 to the 5 hours of supercomputing time, and actually they didn't find any kinetically relevant pathways with that. Uh, whereas they do, and they only needed 100 hours of, super com of CPU time. They use something called uh, transition current sampling. So we now have a benchmark for kinetics, because other people can do it. Let's see if I can do it on the laptop. So this is not going to be a movie. This is going to be another heroic attempt 
which may fail. Um, okay, 17, 9, 20, 15. I'm going to use all four cores of the laptop, seed it with the date, and first we need an initial pathway. I'm telling it minima in the two different sets of states. Here's our initial path, transition state energies, E plus and E minus, and now we start discrete path sampling, and we, try, we build up a kinetic transition network. Here's the original pathway, energy as a function of stationary point, and the blue one is now the best one, so you see it's evolving as the number of cycles goes on. Uh, our Aeneas plot forward and backward rate constants as a function of temperature started out 30 orders of magnitude too low. That's always the way around that it goes. We're aiming for the red ones, so we've already gained quite a few different uh, pathways already. And on the right, this, will, this could be a movie, but uh, if I try and play that at the same time, it's probably going to be unhappy. So you can see what's happening to the path. We're actually getting a longer path with a lower barrier. And, uh, hey, and we now have convergence. Good. So we can do it in under a minute, actually. It's not fully converged to high temperature, but there you can just run molecular dynamics. We don't care about that. This is a problem we're trying to solve. So uh, this pathway is much longer, but has a much lower barrier. And this is fast because I'm using geometry optimization. No explicit dynamics. I'm replacing that with unimolecular rate theory, which is... Uh, this temperature is actually quantitatively accurate. Uh, so to make a connection with the first talk, everything I've shown you has all degrees of freedom. But uh, in biology in particular, people very often project onto free energy surfaces, choosing order parameters or reaction coordinates or something. And this can produce problems, because you would need a perfect order parameter to faithfully reproduce your pathway. So I had a look at this for LJ38, and one particular pathway between the icosahedral and FCC-type structures. Um, okay, it's half an hour. And what I did was restrict the uh, sampling to a tube around this pathway, and I used the path length, the integrated path length in Euclidean three-dimensional space S, and here's the potential energy. And these two panels are, are the free energy as a function of an order parameter Q6, which is actually the best one we know for this system. And on the right uh, is what you get if you use S, the path length, where we've faithfully reproduced the whole pathway. And I've used a distance for the, a tube width of 0.7. And this is the free energy at different temperatures. And you can see it's actually mirroring the potential energy at this low temperature quite well which you would expect. It's going to be mo uh, moderated by some entropy, but mostly this is potential energy dominated. The main difference here is that a lot of the structure is washed out when you use an order parameter projection, because if you sample on two sides of a barrier, um, if, they don't, if they have the same value with the order parameter, then you lose that barrier. And that's exactly what happens here at this end point. There are two minima with icosahedral cores, but different surface packings. One is Mackay, one is anti Mackay, and they get lumped together. So you lose this uh, minimum here in this free energy projection. So you get the wrong rates, unless you fix it by do plugging in some dynamics later on. Here are some surfaces which should show this effect very clearly. It's the same surface, different views. So the global minimum is this FCC one hiding over here, or here, depending on your view. And these two minima are those two here, separated by a big barrier. But you can see, if you project onto Q6, they're lumped together. So Q6 is actually pretty good, apart from this bit. Uh, and we don't know of a better order parameter. So I'm going to suggest that you could just use the integrated path length. So we have all these pathways. We've, we've used them to make our kinetic transition network. So um, all of these data are available if you want to test uh, a low dimensionality uh, projection or propose a reaction coordinate. But in the methods I'm describing, you don't need a, a reaction coordinate. You just need a definition of the endpoints. And then you'll extract a phenomenological uh, rate constant between them. Any questions?
Is, is that clear enough? Am I going too fast or everybody wants lunch? Okay, so I've got to put in a few examples then. So this one is the knotted protein, uh, which is probably the hardest interpolation that we've had to do so far. I had to produce a new interpolation method uh, to actually get an initial pathway for this, because if you draw a straight line between product and reactant here, the chains cross over, and all the empirical potentials used in biology, charm and amber and so on, permit this. And not only do they permit it, uh, the energies of the stationary points that you get for the chain crossings are not stupid. So you can't filter them out that way. So you need to maintain a non-crossing uh, database throughout, or you'll be in trouble. This was work done with Mike Prentice, and the protein is a tRNA methyl transferase that Sophie Jackson studies in Cambridge. It's got a deep trefoil knot. And here's the disconnectivity graph that we've calculated for it, uh, colored three ways. So these are native-like structures where the knot is made. Of course, it's not a complete knot. We don't have the ends tied together. Um, and I'll show you a bit more of it in a minute. Uh, and these two, other, these two pieces in red and green have one end of the knot made, but not the other. So here the, uh, the red end is correct, and here the blue end. Uh, I'm not going to bother you with this, but this is uh, how I actually managed to do the interpolation by adding extra images that prevent the chains from crossing. Let's go to the mechanism. So I'm using a representation that doesn't show all the atoms here, because that would be a bit confusing. It's a ribbon representation. Uh, and the first thing that's going to happen, well, everything that's going on now is pre-organization. This is going to form a loop that will pass over here. So at the moment, if I pull on the blue end, nothing would happen. But it makes this loop, and I'll speed it up a little bit. It makes a loop, and then its end goes over. And then if you pull it now, something different will occur. And now the red end does the same, passes over, and now we've got our knotted structure. So um, this, is a, uh, this mechanism was described as two slip knots by Jose Onyuchik. It's a slip knot because until it crosses over, and you, uh, if you pull it, nothing would happen. <coughs> okay. And then I thought it would be interesting to show this landscape. So this is a, quite a recent paper. And it was mostly done by uh, Yasmin Chibaro, who's now uh, in Switzerland. And it shows you what happens if you study an intrinsically disordered protein. This is a, the Puma protein, which stands for P53 upregulated modulator of apoptosis, Puma, studied by Jane Clark and lots of other people. Um, it's a drug target, uh, and it's a promiscuous binder. So it has lots of different potential partners, uh, which make it interact in different ways. So we thought that would make for an interesting landscape. But here's a projected free energy surface. Yasmin still likes those. I didn't manage to convert her away from them. But let's look at the disconnectivity graph. What do you notice? Well, look at all the funnels. And they're all slightly different structural motifs with bits of alpha helix in. And the full alpha helix is way up there, in fact. So this made me think, because we've been studying these multi-funnel landscapes in atomic and molecular clusters for, uh, well, 15, 17 years now. We know a lot about them, uh, you know, the, the heat capacity features, separation of timescales, and so on. Um, but one of my colleagues always says that biological molecules are no more complicated than they need to be. So why does the Puma protein want to have this landscape? I think the answer is, it's an intrinsically disordered protein. Okay, I think it's an intrinsically multifunctional protein. It has all these different binders which, by which it performs different functions. So I think that uh, these IDPs, intrinsically disordered proteins, are going to be associated with intrinsically multifunnel landscapes. So this came as something of a revelation. So we're trying to test it on other intrinsically disordered proteins now to see if it's general. But with the benefit of hindsight, isn't this the way it should be if it combined dozens of different uh, protein partners to do different jobs? When it binds any one of those, I, what I think will happen is it will simply stabilize a particular one of these funnels, one of these morphologies, and pull it down relative to the others. So there's a hypothesis. 
and uh, lo uh, lots more work to get on with there. Now, I said that everything here was founded on geometry optimization, so you'd better be good at geometry optimization if you're going to do it. Um, minimization is usually easy. We use a, a, a limited memory BFGS procedure, uh, one that I played with and removed line searches from. We spend most of our time finding transition states, and we use hybrid eigenvector following for this uh, with candidates that we obtain from something called doubly nudged elastic band. All of this stuff is coded in public domain software, Gmin, Optim, and Path Sample, and you can get them from here, the Cambridge Landscape Database. So there was another point about making databases of, of networks. So you'll find there are some here already. Uh, the LJ38 one is there, 75. Some of them are a bit, are a bit big, so I would make them available on request. And uh, people ask for things, particularly the biological ones. So if, uh, a more systematic way to do this would be a really good idea, actually. Uh, because if we want to benchmark things, we should be using the same databases. Uh, these codes are maintained under the Subversion uh, Revision Control software, and you get a tarball image every 9, nine o'clock in the morning here, so you get all our latest bugs if you'd like them. Uh, and we'd love contributions, so if anybody would like to help, please let us know. There are algorithms that you could easily put in. There are interfaces to many electronic structure codes, and we probably should talk about databasing. I saw it was on the uh, agenda for later, but um, cross-linking some of these things would be good. We've tried put to put together benchmarks, <coughs> benchmarking examples for peptides and transition state searches at these sites. Okay. And if you are good at geometry optimization, then you can go back to that water cluster that I showed you at the very beginning and do some quantum dynamics on it. And here we've uh, worked with Stuart Althorpe in Cambridge. This is an aside, but I, th I think it's fun. So we've used uh, the Feynman path integral representation of the partition function, where you break things down and make a, an isomorphism with a ring polymer. So you find that you can express the quantum partition function in terms of an effective potential, which is the real potential <coughs> plus these spring images. And you can differentiate this. So basically, if you've got capital P of these images, then it becomes a, a problem in 3 times n times p degrees of freedom. And in the instanton approach, Stuart and co-workers have shown that the transition states of this effective potential are a, a finite difference approximation to instanton pathways. These give you quantum rates and tunneling splittings. And, they, and it means that all the degrees of freedom are treated quantum mechanically. Approximately. So, here is another pathway for that water trimer. And it's a different one from one I showed you earlier. It's called bifurcation tunneling, where this water molecule is a double donor and this one is a double acceptor. And it produces much smaller tunneling splittings because you can see there's a lot more motion. And actually, now we're breaking and making hydrogen bonds. So there's a bigger energetic barrier. Okay, here it is again. This looks the same, but actually it's not. This is the instanton version, and I think we've got 25 different images here. But this is an endpoint of one of those orbits. It's a minimum, and all 25 of those structures are the same. They're at the local minimum. But look what happens along the pathway. About halfway, the protons are delocalized. So this is uh, the realization of quantum tunneling along the pathway. So when you find the transition state of this effective potential and then relax it towards the two minima, the transition state's around here. Look, there's a, there's a bit of contribution from this proton as well, but it goes back to the same place in the end. And it's the, uh, the, these two that have swapped over. So I put that in for fun because I, I wasn't sure there was going to be any quantum mechanics in this. Okay, so back to stuff that might be more relevant, coarse grain modeling and design. Uh, we've played around with a lot of different coarse grain models to try and make representations of soft matter and mesoscopic systems mostly. Um, representations that are really decorated rigid bodies to make icosahedra with these indices 1, 3, and so on. Uh, I, I'm going to show you that actually, the snub cube. Um, th a lot of this work was done by Zillard Feiger, and I'll return to Zillard Feiger shortly. You should know who was my first Transylvanian PhD student. 
and he's now back in Transylvania. Uh, and, okay, things I'm not going to talk about. You can make building blocks that can be tuned to give left or right-handed helices, depending upon the angle between these two parts of a bow tie building block. And I might get to the patchy particles, let's see. We're using an angle axis formulation for all the rigid bodies, um, which is particularly convenient because all the rigid body bits can be coded once and for all. Uh, they're fixed, and then to develop a new potential, all you need is the site-site interactions between the rigid bodies. Uh, and the representation is very compact. In fact, I can put all the first and second derivatives on a single slide. There it is. Now that you've absorbed that, here are some results. So, uh, icosahedral shells, these are decorated pentagonal pyramids with some interaction sites on them. Um, here we have 13 of them, and the global minimum is a, a nice icosahedron. And I'm not claiming that these are physical representations of a real virus capsid, I'm just showing you what we've got for this potential. But for the same potential, with some hexagonal uh, pyramids, you can make the next icosahedral structure, this one uh, has a, is losing a hexagon over here. But again, these are very efficient self-assemblers. They will go like that to the global minimum, just like the Leonard-Jones cluster I showed earlier. Okay, so we'll take that potential. We'll do something different with it. Whoops, back one. We'll put 24 pyramids together, because that could make two icosahedra. Uh, but in fact, it also makes a snub cube. And this is interesting, because... Uh, at the size 24, polyomavirus capsid protein VP1 actually does make a left-handed snub cube uh, without the genome. So I could claim perhaps this is an emergent property. We didn't fit to this or anything. It's just there for the same potential that stabilizes the icosahedron. So th this representation uses decorated rigid bodies, but you can have more compact ones. Uh, you can use this uh, pyramidal Yalaraki potential uh, which Zillard calls the ultimate Lego. It's like an, um, a Leonard Jones potential with uh, shape, repulsive and attractive shape. And so these look like, for the representation that we've used, they look like discoids. And we've added some extra sites so that they have an inside and an outside. And here's the energy of the global minimum as a function of n. And these particular dips are where you get magic numbers, special structures with particular stability. And we have an icosahedron at 13. Uh, we have an icosahedron at 32. This is actually 24, the snub cube, again. This is 72, which is the next size up, the next icosahedron. And at intervening sizes, you get uh, distorted structures. You can actually get conical, biaxial, prolate, oblate shells, things like that. So it's an alternative to some of the other models that uh, some other people are going to talk about later in, in this workshop. Um, this is uh, the one that we've played with mostly. It's incredibly adaptable. So you can make tubes, spirals, and so on out of it. And, and now a warning, because it's lovely to come to these meetings. Thank you very much for asking me. It's a, going to be a great workshop. Um, but if you travel too much, you may find that your students' minds stray to the dark side. So I said that Zillard was from Transylvania, and when I came back from one meeting, I discovered that he'd been trying to make life. So he'd mix two building blocks, one that likes to make a shell, and one that li likes to make a tube, and he's trying to make a bacteria phage here. He hasn't added the legs yet, but we're waiting for that. So if you do have a Transylvanian PhD student who's trying to create life, I really think you have to call this the Frankenphage. <laughs> and this is the global minimum in the next list. And with the same representation, but different sites, some different parameters, so it's the same potential with some different parameters, he's actually made a, a really nice model of um, tobacco mosaic virus. And here one of the Leonard Jones sites is actually embedded. But he can match the geometry in terms of the pitch and the separation, uh, almost quantitatively with this model. So it's very adaptable. Okay, that's 45 minutes. Any questions? Yes, please. How are we going to use this to have these, uh, these particles uh, dock to kind of a simple model of biopolymer? So basically the genome of the page. Oh, right. So 
We haven't tried doing a genome. We've done some templating, though. So we've tried to put different T numbers inside each other. There's one particular size that doesn't really appear here and should do. Uh, and if you add a template, a scaffold, um, then you can get it. What we haven't done is try to put anything genomic inside. And we certainly could. Uh, we'd probably, again, want to coarse grain it. So let's have a coarse grain model of the genome and some cool screen Coulomb interactions or something. So if you'd like to suggest something, um, and even better, if you'd like help to do it with the software, we could certainly do that. It would be really interesting. Yeah, so these, these pages that have capsids, yeah. they, they're, they're really sophisticated uh, in biology. So they, they assemble a capsid and then they end up pumping DNA. I know, and, and so... There are, there are special sites on the surface and all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. So we're not making no attempt to model that. And I'm, I'm not calling it a virus capsid. I'm just calling it a shell. So, but, but maybe we'll get some insight from it. But if you, I was just going to suggest that yeah. there, there are Phil Memphis pages where you yeah. kind of abstract away the, the, the DNA content to some extent. Yes. And then they just kind of simply get coded on their way out of the cell. So they're, they're uh -huh. not doing any... They don't need any molecular motors that pump the genome to high pressure inside, uh -huh. the, inside the shell. And, and those are really useful for, okay. for molecular biology. Well, let's think about something that we might be able to model over lunch, perhaps. Okay. Um, so, uh, using the same potential, actually, and with two ellipsoids, uh, this is a collaboration with Paul Barker's group in Cambridge. He does atomic force microscopy. And he, he's trying to make novel optoelectronic materials, and he's trying to make them from amyloid fibers. Uh, and so in their experiments, they stick a cytochrome onto an amyloid fiber, and they observe twisted and spiral ribbons and systematic kinking, depending upon what cytochrome they put on. And they'd like to tune the distance between the cytochromes, because that's where your optoelectronic properties are going to come from. So they were looking for a theory to try and explain the structure. And Chris Foreman uh, actually developed this model, with Zillard's help actually, uh, in terms of pairs of ellipsoids rigidly linked together with an internal frustration defined by the angle between the ellipsoids. And this was able to reproduce all the experimental morphologies. And then Chris went for a walk in the botanical gardens and realized that Bohemia seed pods also have this morphology. That's a seed pod there. And they use it to throw seeds out when the stress is released. Um, and the same theory that explains these different structures actually applies to these macroscopic seed pods. And then Zillard, the Transylvanian PhD student, uh, went to Toys R Us and bought some buzz magnets and stuck them together with putty and found that actually the same theory worked for the pitch angle here. So I thought that was beautiful. So here's a, a cartoon of, of a fiber with three strands. You can see pairs of ellipsoids here, and the round blobs are the cytochromes that are decorating this amyloid fiber. And this is going to be a horror movie. It's a horror movie because it's got Zillard Feige's Transylvanian hand in it with his building blocks. This is not live streaming, this is recorded. Uh, and so he's made these pairs of buzz magnets and tried to fix the angle between them and stuck the putty on and he's going to wiggle it around. And you can see it's already got a natural twist, and that was the angle we were trying to uh, explain. So he's going to muck about with it, but it still normally goes back to the same place. Okay? Right. So, what else shall I show you in the remaining time? Um, I could go... I think I have got time to do both of these, actually. So, a putative nano device. This is a, a model based upon rigid dumbbell building blocks done by Dwipin Chakrabarti, and it was inspired by some colloidal uh, uh, part, building part, block particles that were reported to make helices. And uh, he, made, he succeeded in finding parameters that made a left-handed helix. There are no chiral terms in our potential, so I said, well, obviously there must be a right-handed one. Why don't you try and find the pathway? And this is the energy as a function of path length between left and right-handed helices, and it goes through a well-defined set of steps and mechanisms where we get a boundary between left and right-handedness. And the interesting thing about this, you'll see from the movie. So this is the pathway, and it's color-coded red for left-handed and green for right-handed, or the other way around. And something 
different for the interface. And you can see that at the top we always rotate the same way, and at the bottom we'll be going in the opposite direction to conserve internal angular momentum. Um, it's like the falling cat problem, if you like. Now let's look at it from the side. And if you look at this reduced representation, as this defect boundary propagates along the chain, you find that the uh, building blocks move apart a bit, like that. And so this mechanism couples linear and rotatory motion together, loosely. So we would like to find a way to exploit that and make a nano device from this system. And to do that, we actually have to, uh, instead of having a flat landscape, for left and right handed, we need something chiral to make it a slope. So we're working on that. And I think the last thing I'll, I'll show you then is uh, going to be related to the patchy particles. So this was work done by John Morgan using a patchy particle representation. And here we were trying to find the simplest building blocks that could make a burnout spiral. Um, and so if you have more, build more sites, it's quite easy to design this. And so we removed them systematically until we couldn't get the Bernal spiral as a global minimum anymore. And it turns out that actually you only need a couple of, of uh, patch, anti-patch pairs offset by 10 degrees from linearity, and the Bernal spiral is a global minimum. You can put in periodic boundary conditions, you can squeeze things, and you get kinks that are like the results that Steve Granick has found. So this is again work inspired by Steve Granick. Um, and so the last movie then is this one which is going to be helix handedness inversion for the Bernal spiral. So this is just a nice representation of the same thing that's going on on the left. And the green and blue patches are the ones that combine together. And actually the mechanism here can also be described in terms of diamond square diamond rearrangements, like the one for that uh, two-dimensional seven-particle cluster. So Bill Lipscomb would have been happy with this again, I hope. You see, we've just made an edge there and broken it. I, th I think I'll stop there. I think that's more than enough stuff to discuss. Uh, so, and it's gone 12 o'clock, hasn't it? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop. <clears throat>small sizes, then the network can change qualitatively, adding one atom. As you get bigger and bigger, yes, it will converge towards the bulk. But that doesn't happen until maybe 5,000 particles for the Leonard-Jones potential. For molecular clusters, it happens for more like 100 molecules. And we understand to some extent why it converges faster for molecules. Uh, but you have to remember that for a finite system, n and n plus 1 or n minus 1 can be completely different. So it's not just the potential, it's the size. You will get convergence to bulk properties, but not in the, uh, some of the regimes I was looking at here. Uh, I do have a movie of that bulk Leonard Jones phase transition, which is crystal to liquid. And at that point, it wouldn't matter whether we, we had 864 particles or 863 which would be a defect structure in that case with periodic boundary conditions. And in terms of quantifying the appearance of the landscape, I mean, I could, it's easy to, uh, to look at it. And, uh, if you sh I, I said we don't do any calculations based upon those trees. The data that is used for the numerical results is all in the database in terms of uh, statistical weights. But if you show me one of the trees, I can do a zeroth order calculation if it's double funnel, I'll predict it's got relaxation timescales that separate and possibly uh, a heat capacity feature. So that's my zeroth order calculation. Um, making a useful single number that reflects the complexity of the landscape 
Uh, it's something we've been trying to do for a while, and I think we have one that is quite good now. Uh, and if you'd like a preprint, I could, I could send you that. Um, and it's quite fast to calculate. I'd still rather see the network myself, but uh, it is good to have something numerical. And you'd expect the glassy system to be horribly frustrated and the good structure seekers to be at the other end of the spectrum and double funnels to be in the middle. And, and, and this index does do that. So to that extent, at least, it's successful. So it's what Alex wrote, the powers of projection slide, as you call it. So I have a similar one. Yeah. And so, so I guess my, my comment would be, so the reason you see disagreement is because you get the wrong order parameter. And so yes. So picking the Q6 is perhaps not uh, a fair comparison. Uh, so picking the right order parameter, presumably for a microscopic transition, a reaction path does exist. And if you pick the right order parameter, you will reproduce. Well, the, the only one that works here that we know of is that integrated path length. So, okay, since so you get something similar from, say, that's a classic band or transition path sampling, which is similar to our path stepping along. But for each microscopic transition, presumably there yes. exists some reaction coordinate or order parameter that would work. Uh, I'm not saying it all on the entire I don't, path, but for each well, transition. If you, uh, you mean if I take just one path there, can I make it? Can I, yes, I can. I can, I suppose, because I, could, I can certainly just use the integrated path length again. Absolutely. So, at the very least, I could do that. Um, I've only really thought about this recently, because we, we don't do projection. Right. The whole point is not to. Uh, what, um, there's no need to if you've got all the degrees of freedom met, uh, retained. I tried to do this as a pedagogical example of why these things can end up being different if you're not careful about your order parameter. No, and, and so, systematically, um, the projection is always going to underestimate the barriers. Uh, so it, it'll be a lower bound to the barriers and, and therefore an, up, uh, an upper bound to the rates. So long as you know that, uh, and if there were a variational way to compute this as a function of an order parameter, that would be really useful, actually. Um, but the other reason I did it was to try and un un understand what some people mean by internal friction. You know, you know in the literature there, there are all these ideas about friction, some of which are actually mechanical friction in a solvent. But... The, this usage of internal friction, meaning the substrate, the protein, uh, actually has nothing to do with friction at all, I would say. It's just going over a barrier. Uh, and so I wanted to do a system with no solvent. I wanted to do something in vacuum where all of that would be completely unambiguous, and I could just resolve things down to what happens if you get the projection wrong. And that's manifested as, as a sort of friction in the projected version because um, you'd need a different diffusion coefficient to uh, get the right dynamics out of it. So you can empirically put that frustration back in by doing a bit of molecular, you know this of course, but putting some molecular dynamics back in to have a position dependent diffusion constant in your diffusion equation and people call that friction as well. And it's coming from the projection in that case. Right, I guess my statement is some projections are better than others. So Definitely. Right oh yeah. Projection. Definitely. Uh, and I think that absolutely your statement is correct that we have all the degrees of freedom, why not keep them? But the alternative yeah. perspective is perhaps by doing some dimensional reduction, you can simplify things and learn something. Absolutely. I'm, I'm right. certainly not arguing against it. Yeah. I'm just, uh, I'm, I, what I'd actually like to do is help. So um, we have all these networks with all the degrees right. of freedom. We have all these pathways. So if you'd like to play with them, and uh, if, we, if we could do a, uh, a parallel analysis of the same system in the two different ways, and see where, where the projection goes and what is a good order parameter and so on, I think that would be really useful. Yeah.